Hello everybody and welcome back to another video. Man, am I just insanely excited to get to show this off to you guys. What if Kestrel Save Sky Part 1 released over a year ago and I'm incredibly sorry for the wait. Please go check out Part 1 first if you haven't seen it or need a refresher. The story won't make sense without it. Wow, making this sequel turned out to be a lot more than I ever anticipated. It took so long because I'd write a lot of it and just not be happy with the result. I didn't want to rush and create a mediocre video. I wanted to make one with an impact and craft a story I could be proud to unveil to you all. Join Peril, Aurora, Kestrel, and Sky on this journey. If you watch the end, I know it'll be worth every second. But before we begin, a huge shout out to my patrons. Dog1195, Three Moon, Slightest Wild, and Fizz. Thank you all so much for supporting me. Links to those social medias are in the description down below. Anyways, without further ado, let's get into the video. Dolphin's talons lingered over the sleeping dragonet in her lap, her eyes laced with hesitation. Every scale in her body begged her to stay sitting, to keep this life. It would be so easy to stay in the cave and never leave it as they took her baby. Dolphin would not be hurt, or so it had been said to her. One life in exchange for hundreds. The elders had told her about the prophecy, and ever since, things had felt more confusing than before. It was supposed to help her understand why her dragonet deserved to die. Dragonet lay below her, eyes closed and peacefully dreaming about the day she naturally thought would come next. After all, how could such a young creature ever be deserving of death? It was the same dragonet who looked at everything with awe and found comfort in the oddest, most overlooked things. Her aurora. Dolphin had never even trusted the elders much anyways. From the moment she hatched, Dolphin had had an endless urge to travel the surface, to see beyond the waves. But the elders and the other members of the tribe warned her of the things that lurked above the sea. Some of it seemed like merely a story. Savage dragons could not exist, could they? Supposedly the beasts from beyond of the shore were wild, ravaging creatures, their fangs and claws stained with blood. Any movement above the water surely meant their gaze would catch yours, and you would be lost to the land. Dolphin always got lectured on knowing her place, and asking questions was wrong. Her rebellious spirit could never be tamed, and she knew the elders had an extra eye on her ever since her daughter hatched. Our eyes are like the ocean. Look beneath the surface. That's how you find a dragon's heart. Dolphin had learned that from her mother. But here she was, looking down at her daughter, who, in her innocence, was blissfully unaware of what was to come. There was a look of regret on her face that the dragonette would never get to see. I'm sorry, my Aurora. Dolphin took one final glance at her daughter's peaceful face, lost in sleep. Her lips were parted in soft silence, breasts quieter than the tiniest wave on the sea. Dolphin carefully lifted her off her lap and onto the cold stone floor. My light, my hope, she whispered softly. I hope one day you will be free from this place. I hope we can meet again above the waves. The words stung as she said them, and the dragon knew there was no turning back. The dolphin stood up, making her way to the cave exit and taking one final glance back at her dragonette with a heavy tightening of her muscles. Every part of her wanted to stay, to hold her in her arms and never let go. But she knew it wasn't possible, not with the prophecy and influence the elders had. So instead, she wiped the tears from her cheeks and breathed softly in the silence. Goodbye, my Aurora Borealis, the sight I've always wanted to see flourish above. Dolphin left the cave that night in an attempt to finally reach the surface, to learn the truth about the world so desperately hidden above. But she never returned that day or the next, not the month after or the years following. Aurora woke up alone, tired and afraid, without the comfort of being cradled in her mother's arms. Mommy, she whispered, barely audible as the elders swarmed the cave in a mad fury, but her mommy wasn't there. Aurora sped through the water in a flash, making marvelous circles. Her tail caused ripples to appear above the surface. Peril was by her side, smiling the biggest smile she had ever seen. If they were underwater, she would have exploded in giggles. Instead, bubbles shot out from her mouth as she nearly fell over, with only the physics of the water renting a hard fall against the rocks beneath them. You're an idiot, Aurora playfully teased with her bioluminescent scales. Though Peril couldn't respond, her laughter muffled by the water said it all. The two dragonets shot up to the surface with a deep breath, making their way over to an elevated rock platform. That was great, Peril said immediately, helping Aurora up. 
You were better. No way, Peril argued. You beat my record of the most flips done underwater. Give yourself a pat on the back. You beat the champion. Peril's heroic pose made Aurora burst into laughter, rolling on the stone floor. Right, I forgot your title. Peril, the Olympic swimmer. Hey, don't laugh. You're just lucky you beat me. Or a burst in laughter again. Frigid beat you, and I don't think that's saying much. The two sisters lay down on their backs, looking up the slack tights. They breathed nearly in sync, catching their breath in the hour spent swimming. After some time, Peril rolled over to face her sister. I like the days we get to spend down here. Me too, Aurora replied truthfully. She smiled warmly at her sister, embracing the moment they got to themselves. Normally, Bermuda or one of the other elders would have been watching them play, but everyone was too busy preparing for the banquet today. It was perfect, just the two of them alone beneath the rocks. The elders made it a tradition to host a banquet every three years in order to honor the ancient animus they assumed to have designed their home. Only magic could create such beauty and bend itself to the needs of its future inhabitants, Bermuda, the oldest sea ice dragon of them all, often said. Rora was always reminded of the story of her tribe's origin any time it could be brought up especially during the banquets in the weeks before them. Thousands of years ago, two sea wings and two ice wings decided to marry outside their tribes amongst each other. The dragonets were hybrids of the two, becoming the subspecies Aurora and everyone in the underwater abyss came to be. They were not quite ice dragons, but not quite sea dragons. They were something new. They were the only intelligent dragons of their age, and the savage surface dwellers hunted them. Even then, before they could form their own thoughts and words, instinct told the dragons to crush any difference from normality. The two families decided instead to choose death, and they wished to starve themselves at the bottom of their favorite lake, where their bones would remain forever. But they were met with slaying far from death. An ancient abyss was hidden beneath their talons, carved only by what could be explained as magic. It was like a doorway to a hidden world, one where them and their descendants would be safe. They took refuge in the place the sea ice wings would call their homes for thousands of years to pass. The river connected the darkest abyss in the ocean, uninhabited by any dragon and impossible to be discovered by the ordinary. And it was beautiful. Hundreds of rooms could be found in the abyss cave system. They dwelled in spaces that seemed carved out of the abyss itself. It had everything a struggling subspecies could need. Some rooms were full of water, and others were like pockets of air. When a dragon swam into one, oxygen suddenly filled their lungs. It was as dry as a surface, no matter how wet one's scales were from being submerged. There was a pond in one of the caves that always seemed to have a supply of fish that never ran out. As long as one took only what was needed, he would be granted with enough, and more, to live off of. No one knew who carved this cave system they called home, but the elders held a banquet every three years to celebrate their blessings. And in recent years, Aurora herself. Bermuda claimed that Aurora was a gift from the ancient animus, and she was to be celebrated and worshipped to thank her. Whenever Aurora asked why she could never reach the surface, she always got the same response from the elder Bermuda. Aurora, you have the power that has been prophesied for centuries. You are the key to keeping the peace in our home, and you are too important to lose. That is why you must stay. Any danger to your scale is the danger to us, and we have worked too hard to sacrifice this life. Others were not as kind. Trying out to the surface, you'll end up like your mother, foolish in her rebellious nature. She wound up dead, Aurora. The others found her body bobbing up on the closest shoreline. She had not even made it a few miles before the savage surface dwellers found her. However, despite how much everyone said they loved her, Aurora felt so alone. None of them were like her. Not until peril. Aurora was appreciative of the glowy, smiley younger sister she now had in her life. Aurora was blessed, or rather in her mind, cursed, with the power of frost scales. Anything she touched other than the water she swam in would turn to ice, even other dragons, as proved by a close encounter with Bermuda when she hatched. But things changed when the dragon had met Peril. Peril was a fire scales, the kind of dragon who could light anything on fire with only a touch. The sisters were opposites of both appearance and abilities, it didn't stop them from feeling so... seen. Nobody else truly was like them, but at least they both knew what it was like. They both felt connected to one another, like sisters bonded by more than blood, even though they were nothing alike in the eyes of others. Aurora remembered the day when she first laid eyes on her younger sister like it was yesterday. 
She recalled it so vividly, with only the memories of recent years keeping her from believing it really was. This was going to be Peril's first banquet, and she wanted to make it count. Even though Aurora found them to be boring and quite pointless, seeing as their ancient animus probably couldn't even hear them, she had always dreamed of someone sitting by her side at the table. Someone she could giggle with and dine with, a dragon who was not dull or obsessed around her. Maybe it would make Bermuda reading the prophecy of her supposed greatness less embarrassing. Maybe. The banquet of good tidings was tomorrow, and every dragon was in a hurried frenzy to finish preparing. Aurora took full advantage of the temporary chaos and brought Peril down to her favorite lake, one they rarely got to visit with everyone keeping such a close eye on the two sisters. Peril always said it was because they were scared of her, but Aurora shook her head. The schedule for the day was strict and demanding, so the relief both of them felt when they could sit under the stalactites after a long day of classes was indescribable. Banquets were a nice break from the schedule, even though Aurora had only been to one once. Even then, her only experience had not been the most pleasant with everyone's eyes on her. More than normal, at least. Hey! A sudden, creaky voice shouted, interrupting Aurora from her thoughts. You two should have been in your caves half an hour ago! It was old Mad Atlantic, the one dragon that didn't seem to like her, or at least was too tired of putting on a mask to make it seem like he did. He limped into the cave, scowling with a look of venomous disdain on every line of his face. Aurora sighed, rolling her eyes at peril. Her sister did the same, but the two of them sat up quickly anyway. I will report you if this reckless and disrespectful behavior continues, Ad Atlantic grumbled. Don't want to act like mommy, do you? He said the words with such venom, but so smoothly and quietly, that peril didn't even seem to hear them. And Aurora's heart nearly stopped in her chest, and the world went silent. Her ears began to ring, thoughts and flashes of a time she could barely remember, going through her head all at once. Aurora? Aurora? She heard Peril's voice faintly, and the world snapped back into focus. Peril's words always seemed to have that effect. Writing to the caves for bed, remember? Right. Sorry, I was just thinking about something. Aurora could have sworn she saw a twisted smile flash in Atlantic's face, but only for a moment. She had the feeling he liked to watch her suffer, and that thought made her shift in her scales. Sisters swam reluctantly to their caves, Peril taking in one gigantic breath on the way. Atlantic followed them from far behind, keeping a watchful eye. Aurora knew it would be, long be a long time before they could be free of his gaze, so she chose to stay silent for the journey. She then became lost in thought yet again, the silence fueling her. Everyone knows old Atlantic is crazy. I shouldn't take anything he says seriously. Besides, Bermuda only keeps him around so she can boss him. But her frantic reassurances to herself didn't help, and his words rang in her head the rest of the night, like the flash photography light of a camera that wouldn't seem to fade away. Pearl woke up slowly, letting out a yawn as she stretched her tired limbs. As fun as swimming late at night under the stalactites was, it was tiring. More so for her, as she always felt she belonged somewhere else than the narrow windings of the caves. The stories Peril had heard about the special banquet from her sister, it seemed wonderful. But Peril knew Aurora didn't love everything about it, especially the attention it put on her. Well, more than normal, anyway. It always seemed like somebody was eyeing Aurora, but not quite with the stink eye they gave Peril. She wasn't from their home. Rita claimed she found and saved her only through the ancient animus' instruction, and she was here for some purpose, the only savage dragon they could save. Wasn't here last time, but I am now, Pearl thought to herself about the banquet. I'll give Aurora the best night ever to make up for whatever comes with tonight. Pearl took one large gasp of air, refilling her smaller lungs, then swam into the central hallway where Aurora, where Aurora was floating. You're late, she communicated with her glowing scales, and Pearl gave a shrug. Aurora covered up her smirk with a sigh, then motioned for her sister to follow. Aurora doesn't seem to be in an entirely awful mood, she observed. Yet. Dragonets lined the hallway, excitedly flashing messages to one another. It seemed like every dragon in the kingdom was attending, and, as Peril realized, that probably was true. Peril, having noticed her sister anxiously fiddling with her talons, put a reassuring claw on Aurora's shoulder. She was so glad she could. Her fire scales and Aurora's frost scales balance each other out temporarily, so for brief moments they could actually hug. It was a feeling greater than anything in the world, and Peril wondered why dragons didn't do it more often. 
How could they treat such a beautiful gift of love as such a normal, everyday thing? For them, contact like hugs? It was special. But for everyone else, it was so calm that they forgot it could even be done sometimes. Pearl motioned for her sister to join her in an oxygen-filled room while the adults were taking count of everyone. Relief filled her lungs as she entered, though she didn't hesitate to speak. Hey, today's going to go great. Besides, I'll be with you the whole time. If anyone tries to lay their talons in you, or bore you to death their talks of greatness, I'll go roar and scare them away, Pearl said with giggles. Nobody really likes me anyways. Rora appreciated the comment and smiled softly at her sister. Hey, they like you. Noticing Pearl's slightly doubtful expression, she quickly added more. Well, besides Chowder, remember that time he accidentally lit his fish fillet on fire in cooking class? <laughs> he totally deserved it, though. He was talking trash. It wasn't my fault my cooking of culinary delight caught on fire while I tried breading it. The sisters burst in a laughter, nearly having to wipe away tears. Looking at Aurora's finely relaxed expression, Peril couldn't help but grin. Wish I could freeze time and live in this moment forever, she thought. She saw the even rising and falling of her sister's chest. The two blinked away the tears their continued giggles brought. Maybe tonight wasn't going to be so bad after all. But even after the thought, Pearl couldn't help but notice all the elders staring at her and Aurora more than anyone else once they re-entered. Feeling in her gut told her something was going to go wrong, but Pearl just couldn't tell what. Lightning illuminated a small cave in the mountains in a brief flash. Kestrel raised her head, fire spewing out of her mouth suddenly. Roasted chicken lay over a crackling fire, providing warmth against the storm raging on outside. The sky was a dull, dark gray. The occasional boom of thunder shook the cave, causing small pebbles to shake and vibrate at the sound. The cold air made its way inside the alcove where the skying mother and her son were taking refuge for the night. Sky couldn't create natural warmth like she could, and Keshaw saw him shivering and staying as close to the fire as he could. I wonder if all the snails are okay, he said weakly. The words were muttered so quietly that Kestrel could barely hear them over the nearby thunder. Their homes might get flooded in the soil. Of course he cared about the snails more than himself, she thought. And yet, Kestrel loved her dragonette's odd fascination with small creatures more than anything else. She didn't know why it didn't frustrate her. If any other dragon would have acted the same way he did, all stupid and lovey about tiny little animals, she would have found it infuriating and the compassion pointless. And yet... Keshel thought it made Skye even more perfect, though she didn't know why. I'm sure they are, Keshel said, sitting down next to him. She put her wing over his shoulder, blocking the cold water droplets from, from the ceiling of the cave from leaking onto his already freezing body. The two sat in silence for quite some time, mother and son, yet still feeling incomplete. Have you had any more dreams about her? Keshel asked, in an attempt to fill the silence. Sky clearly wasn't expecting the question, but still answered after a moment. I sometimes do, but I can't control when I see her. I just do sometimes. Sky had been seeing his sister in his dreams. Well, rather his nightmares. He'd been constantly reliving that last moment he had at the fire scales dragonette, even though he didn't quite remember all the details out that well himself. If not for his subconscious, the memories would have faded and ended up forgotten. Keshul marveled at Sky's brilliance and somehow remembering a lot of it, even though they were from only a few days after his hatching. Her first memories began when she was a few months old, not a few days. This time was more clear, Sky added. She's out there. I know it. Keshul wanted to believe her daughter was alive. She really did. But she dropped her in a river and she never came back up again. Scarlet's guards had searched like mad to try and find the dragonette, but they couldn't even find a body. She assumed the fire scales dragonet was thrashed around by the rapids, likely drowned, the body washed up somewhere else, then to then be eaten by the animals at the shore. After all, the river she was in was one of the longest on Pyria. Who knows where she could have ended up, assuming she was even alive in the first place. Poor dragonet without a name, Keshul thought with remorse. Wish I could have had more time with you. But Sky was adamant that his sister was alive. He had been for the past four years they had spent hiding out from Scarlet's troops. Nobody could even know they were alive, not even the Talons of Peace. It would be too dangerous to put all the newly born prophecy dragonets at risk just because of her mistake. Hesha wondered who was going to take her place in raising them instead. 
Hopefully Asha, the dopey, cheerful mudwing who always went on and on about how every dragon was important. Kestra would have been asked about her thoughts on Asha a few years earlier. She would have pointed out her pointless compassion and possible dreams. But now, even as much as she made snarky comments about her, Kestrel wished Sky had a mother like that. Instead, he was left with her, a dragon who could even face her own problems. A dragon who couldn't even let her son fly into the sky he so lovingly adored. Some nights, she would lie awake, not able to look at her son's peaceful form in sleep. He doesn't deserve me. I need him, not the other way around. That isn't how a mother should be. He should look at me for assurance and love, but yet I don't even trust him with the one thing he's been saying for years. Maybe I should trust him. Maybe I should give him that chance. Kishel sat on that thought. Her son had never doubted her defiantly. Whenever Skye knew something she didn't, he never seemed upset that she was hesitant to believe him. And for a time, Kestrel did believe what Skye said the few times he spoke up. But the one thing she never believed him about was the fact that her daughter was alive. And now, she wondered why. I think part of me doesn't want to believe she is, Kestrel thought. The image in her head of her daughter suffering, cold and alone, pained her more than the thought of her not existing at all. So, she took what little comfort of the fact she could that the fire sales dragonette wasn't in pain anymore. She was far, far from here, living a new life with new parents and a new family, and a chance more fitting. But maybe she didn't have to suffer to be alive. A new sense of hope found its way inside Kestrel that night. For the first time in years, she felt excited at the possibility. What did you see? She finally asked, lifting her head from her previously lying position. Sky looked rather startled at the question, but his expression softened once he realized Kestrel really did want to hear. Maybe now they could find the dragonette, and it was up to Sky to find out how. The banquet's opening ceremony started with such elegance that it had peril, standing in awe and admiration. Aurora looked over at the shocked expression on her sister's face and couldn't help but smile. Okay, she admitted to herself, it is a little cooler than I remembered. Dragons and opera masks covered in ocean jewelry danced around the massive clo cloth dinner tables, while live music was being performed on an elaborate decorated stage. Every sea ice dragon in the entire abyss was here, gathered for the one ceremony that brought each of them together. Instead of the usual serious and grumpy expressions that seemed stuck on everybody's faces, Aurora saw smiles and genuine looks of joy at how beautifully decorated things were this year. Even the elders, sitting in their elegant chairs near the front of the table, looked entertained and impressed. Even though this night is about me now, maybe for one day I can actually focus on something other than my destiny. Peril's here, and she promised to be with me the entire night. Maybe things won't be so awful like last year, after all. The previous banquet when Aurora was three was a messy night full of an uncomfortable amount of attention and staring. With the cheerful spirit going around this year, she finally felt like she belonged and could fade away from the curious and intruding thoughts of others. It's almost like it was too good to be true. Which, Aurora had learned, usually meant it was. Good evening, Aurora, Solstice, one of the elders, said as she motioned for Aurora to take a seat with her at the front of the table. Bermuda has an excellent reading of the prophecy planned for tonight. She tried to hide the fall in her expression, but Peril managed to notice a sudden change. Poor Aurora, she thought. I wonder what's so bad about one of the elders reading the prophecy out loud, though. Maybe she doesn't like everyone's eyes on her or something? Such as Peril loved her older sister, Aurora always puzzled her. Peril had known very little about why she herself didn't look like the others, but the elders never paid much attention to her, so she couldn't even ask. During her question fates the drag as a hatchling, she always bugged them until she got a response. Most usually responded with, You look the way you do because of your ability, but you are still one of us. But Peril really didn't seem to believe it, especially because her talons weren't webbed and her scales didn't light up under the water, like everybody else's. But as she loved the ocean, she didn't feel like a sea ice wing, nor did she even look like one. But because she couldn't put into words how, she thought it wise to keep her mouth shut instead. That usually made the other dragons happy and relieved. If it had bothered Aurora, though, she had never said anything. Good evening, my tribe, Muta's booming voice said al aloud. It is my honor to have you all in our dining hall to celebrate such a momentous occasion. The room erupted in applause as everyone took their seats. Chefs into the kitchens began serving the first course. Pearl couldn't help but admire Bermuda's appearance. She was a large dragon, even her stature demanding awe. 
Her silvery oceanic scale sparkled in the illumination from the candles. We gather here today in honor of our savior, the one who built our home, but also to celebrate the one she has given to us. Aurora Borealis, the protector of the abyss. Aurora Borealis, protector of the abyss, several dragons shouted, bowing their heads in tribute. Tonight, I will be reading the prophecy given by our esteemed protector, telling of the great glories that will come with such a magnificent dragon in our midst. That's your cue, one of the elders flashed. Aurora gulped down a serving of fish that had just been put in her plate, awkwardly sliding out of her chair. As she shuffled to the stage, ears nearly deafened by the surrounding applause, she saw Atlantic wave to her slowly, an odd and indecipherable look on his face. Weird, she thought, looking to see if Peril had noticed. Seeing she hadn't, Aurora continued walking. Taking her seat on a smaller throne next to Bermuda, she anxiously looked down at the crowd. I'll never get used to this. She scanned every face, trying to avoid locking eyes with Atlantic, who stared at her and continued eerily smiling, a rare expression on anyone's face in the tribe, especially his. When the clapping ceased, Bermuda held the prophecy scroll high and furling it slowly. Aurora felt the silence stab through her like a knife as a head elder read it aloud. Bring your old, your tired, and your weak, for the one is coming that you seek. A dragonette born of ice and snow will have all it takes to stop the flow. Something is coming that will shake the land. Something is coming that will unearth the lies. The secret of the word will, will soon be found, for through her all will be sound. It is through her I find peace and sanctuary, Bermuda added, casting a glance at the stiff aurora. The crowd murmured in excitement and respect, flashing signs of gratitude to the dragonette with their scales. She took this as her cue to leave, trying to slip off the throne as discreetly as possible. Place your trust in our savior, and from the be and the being from beyond will reward us all with everlasting gifts. As soon as Aurora's talent touched the stage below, a horrible voice shot out from the applause. The room fell in complete silence. Ha! You mean place our faith in you, you disgusting, traitorous piece of filth? Aurora recognized the voice of the dragon speaking instantly and felt her entire body lock. Atlantic. What? Bermuda asked, muscles tensing. What did you just call me? I'm calling you what you are, he hissed, slipping out of his chair. Everyone watched, transfixed in the sight and almost hypnotized by it so much that not one dragon could move to stop him. Pearl's heart thumped loudly, the blood rushing to her ears. What's happening? The prophecy is fake. It's all lies. She's been spreading unbelievable falsehoods into your heads for years. And you imbeciles choose to believe it. And for what? Do you want to be lied to and cradled like babies for all of eternity? The real prophecy is out there, and we are all going to die. Yet you all choose to lie to yourselves rather than accept a fate greater than all of us. This tribe is cursed. We have not been given a gift. We have been given a death sentence. Lentic slowly approached the stage, stumbling and hobbling on his limp leg. He had mad fury in his eyes, twitching as a vein bulged in his head. It looks as if he hadn't slept in weeks, and if Aurora was being honest, he probably hadn't. The bags under his eyes were as dark as the deepest depths of the ocean, a haunting sight that would strike fear into the heart of even the strongest dragon. But I can prove it to you all, Atlantic continued in his fury. You all have called me mad for years. Years! I've been outcasted and shunned for what I know. He turned toward Bermuda slowly, muscles nearly creaking like rotting wood. You. I will kill the one you've tried so hard to protect. We will all die before your real prophecy happens. I will make sure of it. Aurora is a curse. Nothing but a curse. She is the one dragon who will kill us all. And I'll prove it. The words stung more than the blow to the face Atlantic gave her did. Before she could so much as blink, Aurora was thrown off her talons, her limp body tumbling down the stairs leading off the stage. Stars danced around her vision, everything slowly turning black. She could feel Atlantic kicking at her ribs as she laid on the floor, helpless and paralyzed by her fear. Is what he said true? Am I a curse? She couldn't as so much as finish the thought, for a shrieking Atlantic was thrown off her by a fiery blur. The seeming elder screamed in agony, his flesh sizzling. Before Aurora's world faded entirely, she caught a glimpse of her savior. Peril stood above Atlantic, her entire weight on his charred scales. 
and the world went black around her, thoughts flooded away. Chaos erupted in the showroom, dragons fleeing for their lives. Tapestries and curtains had gotten snagged on Peril's tail as she desperately ran to save her sister, causing terrible fires to rage out of control and spread throughout the room. Atlantic lay dead on the cold stone floor, his flesh sizzled to a blackened crisp. Feral felt a sudden wave of queasiness run over her, spreading through her entire body like a wildfire. Like the wildfire I am, Peril couldn't help but think. Panicked, the outsider grabbed her sister by the underarms and tried pulling her away from Bermuda and the others. As she dragged a roar from the chaos, Peril took in the sights of the crumbling and burning room around her. Dragons were shrieking in fear, running from a fiery end. When they saw Atlantic's limp form, they let out cries. Glass from fallen plates and goblets lay in shards in the floor, shredding the bottoms of Peril's claws. But all she could think about as the smoke suffocated her was to get a roar to safety. Please, mysterious animus dragon, she thought to herself, though we even may have said, said it out loud. If you're really out there, save us. Save me and my sister. It was almost as though the ceiling came crashing down, and Peril could not tell what was around her now, as her eyes teared from the smoke. After it felt like an eternity, Peril finally reached an underwater room that led to an air pocket. Fresh air, she thought with relief. Roar was unconscious and bleeding heavily from Atlantic's sudden and almost lethal attack. Blood continued to flow from a huge gash on her side, and Peril worried one or more of her ribs could be broken. She had not been able to assess her sister's wounds properly until now. She found herself nearly wanting to vomit at the sight. Stay calm. What would Aurora do? Peril's sister had always been the one with perfect grades in health class, but never Peril. She'd always accidentally bump into something and created a hazard for everyone else in the classroom. But, as she had now figured out, she was the hazard, not the fire skill she was cursed with. Please, wake up, Peril silently begged, too scared to shake Aurora's shoulder. Almost as though in response, Aurora started coughing mere seconds later, her face scrunching as she blinked slowly against the tears of her eyes. Peril? Aurora! I was so worried, she said. Her sister now not bothering to hold back the tears. She was alive, but what about everybody else? Not just her classmates made fun of her and left her out of everything, Pearl found herself wondering if they had made it out. She wondered how anyone could have made it out. Aurora tried sitting up, but grimaced in pain before holding onto a dress desk drawer for support, freezing the knob instantly. With her added weight as she tried to readjust herself, the door she had been holding onto opened. A piece of paper was sticking out of it, sealed shut with stiff wax. Aurora squinted, eyeing the piece of parchment sticking out from the drawer. Using what strength she had, she reached over and grabbed it with one talon, unfurling it gently. A layer of ice spread at her touch, spreading over part of the page, but the words were still legible. What does it say? Pearl asked, trying to read over Aurora's shoulder. But her sister's face went pale white, whiter than it had been before the blood loss. Aurora? She only handed it to her sister, mouth void of speech. The paper was labeled, The Prophecy of the Abyss Dragon, almost something that sounded like the title to a fantasy book. But this was real life. Pearl read its contents aloud, feeling her voice shake at the first word. Darkness is coming to shape the land. Darkness is coming to change the world. Remember the lessons forgotten at a time. Remember the wisdom of seeing through the eyes. Falsehoods cannot reign. Blood cannot always be seen. Ally together, two of the fallen, for the fate of all dragons will soon be perceived. He's talking about me, Aurora whispered softly. What? Atlantic said it was a curse. Was this what he was talking about? Am I going to be the one bringing the darkness, like it says in the prophecy? Am I the fallen? Pearl felt a whirlwind of emotions burning inside her, but she would never allow herself to believe her sister would be the one prophesied to bring about such destruction. Not the Aurora she knows. If anyone, it's me, Pearl thought, but kept that to herself. I don't know what that piece of paper said, but you're not... Suddenly, the voice of Bermuda shouting over the crackling flames shot through the air like the stabbing of a blade. Find them! The realization of where they were hit Peril instantly. They were in the Elder Bermuda's office, the most forbidden room in the entire abyss. We have to go. Rora grabbed the frozen prophecy, tucking it under her bleeding wing. Can you help me up? Peril nodded, shifting her sister's weight on her. Their eyes darted around the darkened room, looking for another exit. 
For me to find out what we saw, we're going to get killed, Aurora said seriously. Face was void of any emotion Peril could identify, and it scared her. But the fire dragon said nothing against the dryness of her throat. Ash still stung at every corner of her mouth. Upon whirling around, the two of them noticed a faint doorway line carved into the rock. A secret exit, one they had to push hard on to open and close behind them. Once the heavy rock made a resounding thud as they were sealed off somewhere else, the sisters finally breathed. What's going on? Peril said, panting. She looked up at Aurora, who was ignoring her own bleeding wounds. The dragon's eyes were transfixed and fully focused on the scroll she had been holding, and its parchment was now stained with ice and blood. It's always too good to be true, Aurora said. Pearl looked up and saw that her sister's eyes were still on the paper, like Pearl wasn't even there. It would have been too good for everyone to like me. It would be destined for something great, something dragons could look forward to. I think my mom knew that. The room was filled with silence, the shouts of the searching dragons now long washed away by the water. Pearl. Aurora, you can't say that. I mean, so what if someone we don't even know wrote down there going to be some, some incoming darkness? I mean, how do we even know it's true? And do the words of others really say your fate? Isn't that something you shape yourself? What is destiny then? Aurora said, eyes glazed over. Pearl did not even get the chance to reply, nor did she truly have the words to say. The two sisters perked up the sound of a current, and not the kind that filled the long hallways of rock. Do you think it reaches the... Definitely, Aurora replied breathlessly. The two dragons finally looked back up at each other. Pearl's eyes were swimming with rushing confusion, but an added sense of hope at the current. Aurora's eyes, however, were far different. She seemed distant now after she read the words in the scroll. It was like part of her was turning into something it wasn't, something she was only told she would become. We'll deal with this later, Pearl told herself. Right now, we just need to get out of here and ride that current, hopefully up and far from these caves. Maybe it reaches the surface, as dangerous as it may be. The sisters nodded at each other in silence, and Pearl took one final big breath before heading into the current that led above. You saw an older version of her this time? Like, if she survived and was out there somewhere right now? Kestrel asked, leaning back to give Sky some space. The young dragon nodded. She was underwater or something. It was murky and hard to tell. It was like someone was giving me a faint signal from far away. I could see her for a few minutes in a kind of haze. He looked hurt. There was someone with her. What did they look like? Sky paused, closing his eyes as he recalled the dream from a few days before. I've never seen a dragon like this before, certainly not in the Sky Kingdom. She was almost a light silver, maybe with small patches of pink and gray. She was no sea wing, though, despite being near water. But her spikes made her not seem like an ice wing, despite her coloring. I have no idea who this dragon was, but she was like no one I've ever heard of or seen. It's like she wasn't quite one thing. Kestrel listened, curiosity filling her for the first time in a while. Her daughter might be hurt, and she was with some stranger near or in the water. But a feeling of relief caught Kestrel, riding through her veins. Her daughter was alive. The way Skye described the young dragonette was exactly as Kestrel knew she would grow. Her red and yellow scales glowing and shining in even the darkest of places, head held high and eyes soft. Sky had been seeing his sister in his dreams, and now he may have just spotted her in them for something that happened a few days ago. She's hurt, but she's strong. I know it. Stronger than I am for even surviving this long, Kestrel thought with pride and admiration. Going to find her, Sky, Kestrel said. She put a talon on his. You two will fly in the sky again, your wing beats sound together in a perfect harmony. Sky smiled widely. And every night when he went to sleep, he prayed a silent prayer to whoever might be listening that he'd see his sister in his dreams again once more. Peril and Aurora reached the surface of the ocean after hours of swimming. If not for the carefully placed oxygen sealed holes for rest along the way, it wouldn't have been possible, especially for Peril. The first time truly, the scouting found herself thanking whatever higher power designed the caves. It's almost like she knew this would happen, but that couldn't be true. The elders had lied about the prophecy. Couldn't they have lied about the ancient animus, too? The worlds had crumbled the moment they saw the story on the scroll and heard the rip of fury in Bermuda's voice. When Peril and Aurora's heads came up over the water, it was like for a few minutes, none of that ever happened. 
It was like they had been sisters embarking on a risky and fun adventure to catch a glimpse of the world above. They were about to be called back home for dinner. But that was not what happened, and they both knew it. A sense of amazement washed over them as they took in the massive, sparkling river and deep blue sky that hung before them. It was like the ocean itself was held high above, but with the wind as its waters. The river was in a phase of calm, and the scissors floated against the current as they took in the sights. A few lone dragons soared overhead across mountain peaks, heading to structures and palaces far away. Each one of them had their own story, their own life, their own adventure, their own destination. Carol was just struggling to think of theirs. Everything had changed so quickly, and it was as though the world ripped the ground beneath their claws. They were floating in an ocean of the unknown, a fire circling all around them in the woods. Aurora, without words, took herself out of the river and sat beneath an alcove of rocks and stone. Peril followed suit, head lowered. If they had been out on the surface world even just a few hours before, it would have been a marveling miracle, revigorating and life-changing. And well, that last part was indeed true, just not in the way either of them could have ever imagined. Pearl sat down next to Aurora, taking in the sisters' silence. After a good while of them staring out at the land and sky, the fire dragon finally spoke. Aurora, things are awful right now. We're far from home and can never go back. Ruta is furious and dangerous, and a lot of what we learned might have been a lie. But I know one thing that's true here, one thing that can't be taken from us. You're my sister, and you always will be, regardless of what some prophecy says. You'd never hurt anyone, not willingly. You mean the world to me. I'm so glad in a world of water, I can always swim to you. Aurora gave a small smile, tilting her head down. Thanks, she said. It's just hard. I found out today that everything I've ever known might be a lie, and most of it really is at the least. Muna probably made up that other prophecy just to make me not want to hurt anybody or think I could. If I knew about my real destiny, I might have become what I'm set to be, even sooner. When I got close, Bermuda probably planned on taking me out of the picture and explaining away with another one of her lies. Aurora, life is so much more than what's said about you. If your future's already laid out in the minds of another dragon, what's the point in even trying to live something you can't make yourself? Her sister sat quietly for a moment, then nodded. You're right, I think. But just the thought that this will come true, it scares me. What if I do hurt someone, Peril? What then? What if all we see happens slowly and there's nothing either of us can do to stop it? This is the fate of all dragons, not just me. Pearl spoke seriously. You're my sister. I can't lose you to this. Forget the prophecy. Forget the scroll. We have a chance at the place your mother lost her life trying to reach. The place she'd hope you'd see someday. It is my first time being under the stars, yet it feels like I was born for this, and I've already lived it once. This is a world far away from what we've ever seen. Anyone would kill for this chance. Roy didn't reply, instead putting her head in her claws. Belly scales lay against the cool rocks, small droplets of rain beginning to wet the ground that stuck out from the shade. Pearl's lungs out a quiet sigh, eyes drifting down. She had the entire new world out in front of her, but it felt like hers was right here. Pearl hoped her sister wouldn't forget. She felt the same way. Bermuda slithered around her office, claws wrenched deeply in the wood of her desk. Small and short hisses escaped violently from her snout, eyes fixed on an open drawer. They found it in their escape, she said under her breath. I told you you should have forgotten it, and that one we found on the river hole was bad news, another elder said. But of course, you didn't listen. The truth is out there now, Bermuda, and they're no longer our dragon's control. You just have to accept their tribes without this power and find another lie to tell them. Rita's ghostly figure loomed bigger than before, eyes closing into small slits. Her arms shook against the desk drawer, talons digging deeper. Her ragged, slow breathing made the other elder go stiff. You do not understand the importance of this hidden prophecy, Bowhead. I have been lying to my tribe for decades. We have worked so hard to protect what we have been given. This harbinger of doom is not going to let us keep it. I spend every day of my life retelling a story I know to be false. But do you understand what that does to a dragon? A lying tongue is what you have to accept for a better future. If they had the truth, none of us elders would have stood a chance. 
The moment one of ours leaves these tunnels and heads to the surface, or even the water behind the barrier, it is dangerous. So, what is one lie or another if it means control, prolonging a greater threat? I know that the prophecy I had in my desk is real, and I have spent every day of my life staring at its words, thinking of every way to stop it. But if you can't stop such a fate, why not end it? Cut off the head of its source. Can a prophecy happen if you kill what's supposed to start it in the first place? I've been thinking and planning every day, waiting each hour with my lies to prevent Aurora's destiny from occurring. So forgive me for not wanting to make up another lie, because those have become every single thought in my head for decades. I want the truth, and I can tell it to the tribe when Aurora is dead and her sister has been disposed of. You're right. It was a mistake keeping both of them alive as long as I have. But you will never dare remark on this situation again, or you will be stripped of your status as a high elder, and you just so might happen to be found, bobbing up and down on the surface, killed by the savage dragons. Same death, I will claim Aurora and Peril met upon mere moments of their escape. Mohead froze, eyes wide. I apologize, Bermuda. I, I had no idea. You clearly did not. Now, go make yourself useful and keep your snout shut. I think it's time for us to go searching for a lost dragon. Sky woke up in a sweat, chest shooting up and down. His scales went cold, his color even paler than before. The rustling woke his mother, who jolted within a second. Sky, what happened? Did you see her? The dragonet nodded slowly, swallowing bile. Some dragons are after her and the other one I saw. They want to kill them, Mom. Keshla's breathing nearly stopped, heart and mind racing at a speed faster than she could ever even fly. It's a million emotions hitting her at once, like the water of a downpour. Part of it was hope in the fact that her daughter was out there, but the other side of her was shaken to her core. The dragons had been watching over her this entire time were out to kill her, and Keshla knew she didn't do something. A fate worse than the rivers would take the fire dragon it. Is she safe right now, though? Where is she? Keshla asked. I'm not entirely sure, but the other dragons said something about a river. Maybe... Maybe she's there, the mother breathed. What if she's been in that river this entire time? Mom, there's no way. We'd have seen her, and that river isn't very deep. If my sister was there, wouldn't we have found her? Kesha thought for a moment, replaying the day in her head. When she got dropped in the water, your sister sank. What if somehow she didn't ride the current? What if she never truly left it? Sky looked uncertain, closing his eyes to relive the dream. Whatever he knew, Sky understood they had to get to his sister, and fast. Pearl walked over the dew-filled grass, singeing every patch of it with her scales. The way the flowers curled, the way the ground seemed to scream at her touch, it was like torture. Pearl knew her sister was going through the real thing. Aurora, she said, looking over. See, I shrugged must take the scroll, like she had been doing all last night instead of sleeping. Her eyes showed the exhaustion. You can't keep doing this. You can't keep looking at that piece of paper like it's going to change things. Yeah, it's not changing my fate, is it? Aurora replied, knocking at a few pebbles near the scroll. Don't say that. I told you. Told me what? That this isn't going to happen? Peril, you don't know this kind of stuff like I do. The prophecies we've heard from the surface, they're real. I don't know where this one came from, but do we have any reason not to believe it? It was something Bermuda never wanted us to see. That means something. Pearl hesitated, taking in a deep breath of the morning air. Even the new world around them felt far, without hers right next to her. You know what I've said, Aurora. You know, one of the elders, the least crankiest, and there is one, if you can believe it, told me something about your mother. She cared about dragons, and she knew the one way to see into somebody, to know who they really were. I know you don't really remember her much, and I never got to meet her, but Dolphin was a really good dragon. So are you. When I look into your eyes, Aurora, I see you. Not some story about who you're supposed to be. I see the sister who I swim with every day, the one who helps me in every turn. I see the dragon I was raised with, claw and claw, through the stairs and the lies and everything we've lived through. I see your heart, and it's a big one. Don't let anybody change that for you. It's your choices you make. Aurora tilted her head down further, saying nothing. That night, the sisters moved further toward the mountains and away from the stream. Peril, my mother, do you think Bermuda did something to her? The dragon had thought for a good moment, face buried in the grass and rocks. 
I don't know. Rora and Peril bundled up next to a fire in the same alcove of rock. For the first time, Peril felt like she truly wasn't there with her. Bermuda's sharp, jagged claws touched the ground with striking force. She pulled herself out of the rapids of the rushing river, shaking off the water from her face. The elder squinted, eyeing the land around the water. It's been decades since I've been up here, she said. Looks like some things never change. Boed poked her head out of the water, climbing out after Bermuda. She looked at the grass and the snails, a newfound awe on her face. Why have you been keeping this from the tribe? I mean, I know we've both been worried about the ice breather, but don't you think risks like this would be worth taking? Bird shot up across the trees, the sky wide open and welcoming. Bermuda saw things very differently. We need to find them, and then we'll focus on what to do next. Surely, seeing as their dragonets led a mind of their own, they won't have gone far yet. I want us to search every square inch of this kingdom separated, and the next, and everywhere on Pyria. Ocean or sky, canyon or mountain, until they're rotting beneath the same ground her mother died to flee to. Peril opened her wings, breathing shaky but, contr but control easing its way into her scales. You can do this. You can fly, and not just in some stupid small cave room. You can be where you were meant to. The open air. It can't be that hard, can it? Turns out it was, and a failed attempt at, at speed caused Peril to go barreling down into a pile of now-charred rocks. She vigorously shook her head, groaning at the attempt. Never been much of a flyer, Aurora began, nor did I ever think I'd teach you, a probably sky dragon, how to fly better. But tell your butt back when you start. It'll help you lift. Pearl looked at Aurora with a smile, seeing a faint trace of one on her sister's face the first time since... before the banquet. How long ago was it now? A few days? A week? Time was going fuzzy, especially now with the sky above her. Pearl had a feeling that she had been here before, by this river, and another dragon was the one in Aurora's place. A mother, maybe. Or a brother. A family helping her in her first big flight as a hatchling, there to bandage her wounds or cheer her success. Oh, and if you want to stay up in the air, clear your head. Focus on the wind beneath your wings and the world at your talent tips. I shouldn't be the one to talk here, but forget about this for a moment while you're in the sky. It's how I forget about things in the ocean. Let the world move you, even if just for a moment. Ride in that current, and you'll know things are going to be just okay. Pearl's heart skipped a beat of thoughtfulness of her sister. It was as though Aurora was finally herself again, and that big sister she had always been in the tunnels. She's helped me through so much. I hope I can finally help her. Aurora was right. The peace of the wind and waves guided her, wings outstretched and tail whipping right behind. She turned in the air, outstretched claws welcoming the current. For a good few minutes, it was like none of this had ever happened. It was like she lived the life she couldn't stop dreaming about, one where she had a family. Pearl knew Aurora was her family, even if not by blood. It just didn't feel complete without the ones they would share that love with, even if she didn't know them. When Pera landed, she was washed over with a greater hope. A better future. One where she could turn back after her great flight, and not see her sister's eyes still locked in the page of supposed destiny. Eyes no longer the same. Aurora was back in that day again. A child younger than her was brought into her home, crying as not even an elder could touch her. Aurora frowned, watching the wiggling dragonette have no dragon to go sit by. The others were talking in a room next door over, but she didn't care about them right now, or what they'd say. Hi, little baby, she said, coming closer. The wailing stopped, the fire dragonette opening her big, deep sea blue eyes. It's okay, I don't have a mommy either, but I can hold you if you want. I can be like your big sister, or I giggle, a tiny body snuggling up against the baby. Pearl audibly reacted to the touch, and a grin grew on her little face. Yeah, sister. I've never had one, but you could be my first. You know, anglerfish has like a million sisters. It's crazy, I know. She's in my class. It's my first year of school ever. I'm getting so big, and maybe I'll even be bigger than one of the elders someday. Pearl giggled loudly, leaning in closer to listen to Aurora. You're such a cute baby, she said. I don't know why you're brought down here or why you look so funny, but I have a good feeling about you, that you're important to me. Do you think so too, little sister? The baby in her lap smiled, almost as though she understood. Sister, she swore she heard her whisper. Sister, sister. Yeah, my sister. 
Aurora felt the warmth on Peril's scales and the weight and feeling pulling her into sleep. She was awoken by a great shout, all the elders and adults nearby crowded around them. That's impossible! How can she- She burned my claw real good. That's- Aurora was sad when they made her be separated from her sister, so they could look at her more, but she never forgot that day. The day her life changed. As Aurora sat in the now ice-filled grass, she wondered how things would have been different without Peril's arrival. If she had just lived the normal life she was supposed to up here, would I have become what I meant to be sooner? Pearl might have delayed it for a while, but I'm scared of the next. What would, be, what would she be able to stop me if I did something I didn't mean? Would I be able to stop myself? The thought stuck with her, and Aurora's mind dragged on for a long time before sleep finally took her. Didn't have its hold on her for long, as before she knew it, a familiar voice echoed through the mountains. Come out, and your death will be swifter than your mother's. Peril! Peril! Aurora shook her sister hastily, and Peril's eyes finally shot open. What's going- But she heard the voice that rampaged through the hilltops. Bermuda had found them. We need to get out of here, Peril shouted, whirling around for an escape. But only a mountain was high behind them, and the rest was open. Bermuda's slithering form came closer by the second, alone, her eyes growing wide upon seeing the glow and shimmer of the two she had tried to kill. Oh, how I've been waiting for this day! You know, Aurora, I really admire the courage. If there's one good thing I can say about Dolphin, that she wouldn't give up on her dreams and her love. I mean, great courage. She was killed for that. But she could never let it stop her. As much as I hate what she has left me, I can ignore the fact that it feels like a blessed curse. Get away from my sister, Pearl growled, jumping in front of a still Aurora. Please, I should have snapped out the fire in your candle when you came to our home. I don't know what particularly made me keep you all these years. Maybe curiosity, fun, boredom, or all three. But I can say your efforts to stop the inevitable will be in vain. I am strong enough to change destiny. Only me. I have done it before by hiding the prophecy, delaying fate, and I will do it again, except end it. You, you killed my mother, Aurora said, voice low and eyes closed. Why did you hurt her? Why did you ruin my life? Maybe believe I'm something better than I am. Rita laughed, a twisted ringing. Pity, maybe. But you and I both know what could occur, and the darkness you had been foretold to bring. I know it's you, and I've studied that parchment every day of my life for ninety years. I have thought and planned and worked and sacrificed so that my tribe stay safe from you, and I'm not going to give that up. You're a killer, Aurora. Your darkness, I see it in your scales. That's why you have to be stopped. No, Aurora screamed, tears rushing down her face in great streams. You can't tell me who I am. We both know you believe it. Every last word on that prophecy page, Rita said. You can let me kill you and your sister right now, or put up a fight and lose to a higher fate. I will never lose control, not like this. Aurora's breathing into slow, and Peril cast a worried glance at the frost emanating from her sister's body in icy waves. That's who I am? I'm supposed to kill you. It's the only way I can protect my family, my life. Aurora, please! You don't have to! You don't have to be a killer! That's not who you are! How do you know who I am? How do you? Apparently everything I've known about myself and my future and my past is a lie. I don't know why I was born this way or why I met you, but I think it all makes sense now. I was supposed to do this, and I'm sorry. I'm so, so sorry, Peril. I never wanted to hurt anybody, but what I want doesn't matter. It's just going to happen. I have to kill Bermuda. I have to stop this. You don't have to kill her! Aurora, please listen to me! The sea eyes dragon whirled around to finally look at her sister, tears seeing every corner of her eyes. Listen to you for what? Because I think the only one actually making sense here right now is the dragon that killed my mother? That's something I never thought I'd say. At least she understands the future, and my destiny is here. The prophecy told me so, and you read it too. The first time ever, Pearl felt the scales around her eyes starting to hiss. Steam came from them, and it occurred to her the reasoning. She was crying. She had never cried before since that day she lost her almond brother, not even when Clam threw a paint bowl at her face and the whole class laughed. Not even when she overheard Bermuda telling Aurora how she wasn't her sister, something neither of them believed at the time. Pearl never thought it would happen like this. She wasn't a hurt, lonely baby anymore, but she sure felt one like one.
We're a step closer to Bermuda, raising a frosted talon. Icicles begin to form in her claws, the moisture of the night rain, night's rain now in a new form. Please, sister, you have to believe me. You have to listen to me. I've listened enough. With that, Aurora sprung toward the sea ice elder. Her whole body fell on Bermuda's, and the old ice dragon hissed and screamed and kicked. Her scales were covered in sub-zero ice and snow, and she rolled in the dirt in vain. Peril was on top of Aurora before she even knew it. The clash of her landing at such a force with her ability sent sparks in the air. Icicles went flying, and crackles of flames pierced through the chaos. Peril kicked at her sister, who, with a shout, was off Bermuda now. Much as I hate you after everything you've done, I won't let you do this last thing. I'm not going to let you make my sister a killer. Bermuda looked at the ground, a new sorrowful understanding found in her face. It almost looked like guilt, maybe. Even just a droplet of it. Peril, why did you do that? She was going to kill you. She was going to kill me. Fire Dragonette shook her head. You don't get it. She wasn't going to kill you. She's going to do something even worse. She's going to turn you into the killer. You would have been nothing better than Bermuda if you murdered her right now. Aurora raised a shaking claw, people small. Is she right? Aurora, Peril whispered. It's okay. We're safe, and she's not going to hurt us anymore. I know we promised each other so much, but I need to promise you that I know you. Look at me, sister. Aurora reluctantly looked, eyes beating Peril's, truly, the first time since the banquet. What do you see when you look at me? Pearl asked. When you look deeply into my eyes, who are you looking at? What kind of a heart is it? Aurora focused, eyes narrowed as she looked into Pearl's striking eyes. I see my sister. I see the same baby I held that night when you arrived. I see the dragon I've lived with for so many years, the one who'd do anything for me. Pearl, I... It's okay. It's okay, her sister said, hushing her. Do you want to know what I see when I look into yours? She nodded, body still. I see a dragon like no other. I see the one whose mother died to protect, whose mother would be proudly looking upon you and what you've done and will do. I see someone who knows how much your sister loves her, the dragons in her life do, even the one she hasn't met yet. I see a sister. I see someone to love. Aurora's eyes began to well up with tears and she buried her neck into perils. I never should have done this. I feel so stupid, Peril. I don't know what made me... So focused on the what words on a page said about who I was. They don't define me. My own actions do. I hurt you. I put you in danger right now. And I'll never forgive myself for it. I'll never forgive myself for making that choice. I cared so much about what a prophecy thought about me that I never looked to the dragon who hasn't left my side. I never wanted to see what she thought my future might be. Pearl gave a small laugh, hugging Aurora closer. The prophecy does make sense, though. I think... I think you were only looking at it one way, the same way Bermuda did. Darkness is coming to shape the land. Darkness is coming to change the world. Remember the lessons forgotten at a time. Remember the wisdom of seeing through the eyes. Falsehoods cannot reign. Blood cannot always be seen. Ally together, two of the fallen, for the fate of all dragons shall soon be perceived. This whole time, it said none of that would happen if we didn't let it. If we didn't stop to look at each other, remember who we are. It's like I was told, your mother used to say, you look into the eyes of a dragon, you can see their heart. Aurora wiped away a tear, giving a small laugh. I wish I could have gotten her. She sounded wonderful. But you're right, Peril. I think she'd be proud to see where I am now. I mean, I'm sitting on the ground she hoped to reach, but part of me knows she'd be happier to see that I'm the one who got here. Does that make sense? Peril nodded her head, smiling. It does, Aurora. It's the truth. Loud wing beats overhead caused the sisters and Bermuda to freeze. Two skywings came down from the sky, mother and son. It's really her sky, Kestrel said, eyes wide and glimmering with teardrops. I've been waiting so long to meet you again. You must be her actual family, Bermuda said suddenly. Everyone jumped, turning to face the elder who was still lying on the ground. Don't worry, I'm not going to do anything. You can do what you'd like with me. Think I've understood something I never thought I would today. Bring me back to the tribe and have them choose my fate. I know now that it's something I cannot always control. I was wrong about this, all of it. I never thought I would think this, but for once, I'm glad I was. I asked you that yesterday and I would deny such a feeling, but things feel 
different now. I know a sorry will never justify or fix anything I have done, and I am here to accept what destiny has chosen for me. Pearl held her head high, giving Verita a look of pure trust and change. Aurora thought for a long moment before nodding, and she lifted Pearl to her feet. I don't understand, Sky said. How are you gone for so long, yet here the entire time? Pearl could hardly believe the two dragons sitting in front of her. The mother and brother she always knew she had, somewhere far off in herself. It didn't feel real after all this time. Aurora spoke for her. There's a hole in the river. It leads to an entire ocean, a world beneath the waves. It's a lot to explain, and I think we can show you guys. But for now, I'd like to thank you. Thank us? For what? For your daughter changing my life. We have an amazing dragon at Sky Dragon. Who is she? Sky whispered, causing Peril to laugh. When she turned to look at her family, she saw Kestrel's eyes on her. Even with you back, I knew things were not complete. Not without your sister with us. Aurora's face lit up with gratitude and love. You really need- You never stop being my sister, you know, Peril told her. Kestrel moved forward, Sky beside her. You never stop being my daughter. Sky ran up and hugged Peril, and though it hurt, his slightly fireproof scales made these touch not so deadly. He said it was worth it, while his eyes were full of tears. Suddenly, Peril felt less ashamed of the one she had in her own eyes earlier. We have a lot to talk about. I'm sure there's been so much on both ends. Yeah, like the prophecy about destiny and Atlanta trying to kill us in the banquet hall? Peril, you're making that sound exciting, Aurora said through laughs. You can't deny that it was... Kind of cool. But I'll start from the beginning, Pearl said with a deep breath. This time, it's your turn. Mother, brother, tell us everything. All right, so I've talked with the tribe, and they're all deciding what to do with the elders, especially Bermuda. It's a tough call, and they're voting on a consequence. But lucky for them, not a murderous one. Rora sat down beside the fire, her family seated next to her. Kestra was so different from any dragon she had ever met, and Sky was a whole other level of amazing. They were perfect, Pearl uniting them all. You know, she said, I don't really think my name fits me anymore. I've been thinking about it. Is Pearl really me? Kestrel hummed and leaned forward, thinking. Well, I did have a name for you before. Everything. I didn't give it, and I didn't feel like I should after what I had done. But I think that name for you is perfect. Of course, you don't have to choose it, and you can pick any of your own. There's so many options out there. Yeah, Sky began, like Flaming Rock or Firestorm or Sky Tyrant, which is the name of a bird. I'm not messing with you. Pearl and Aurora burst into laughter, Kestrel following suit. No, this one is different. I was thinking, Ember, you glow when you thrive in the ashes, the hardest of times. You never falter, never waver for the dragons you care about. Ember's smile grew wider than it ever had. Her feeling, her heart feeling as high in the sky as she could even ever reach with her wings. I like that. Well, Ember, I think it's time we showed them the amazing place we grew up, Aurora said. Mine is the whole elders trying to kill us thing. It can be pretty great. Noticing the horror on Sky's face, she continued. Don't worry, you won't drown. There are oxygen areas for you to refill your lungs and rest. Come on, it'll be awesome. He looked at Kestrel, who smiled and grabbed his talon. This guy was pacing back and forth in front of the river hole. I don't think we should do this, he muttered. Trust me, you'll be fine, Farrell said. They all readied themselves to re-enter, taking a big breath before diving into the dark. This is a really bad idea, he screamed amidst the giggles of his family, and they all knew it was going to be all right. Dolphin awoke suddenly, talons submerged in a low bed of water. She looked around, head turning in every direction. The space she was in was like nothing the dragon had ever laid eyes upon. It was dark nearby, but it wasn't the scary kind of darkness. It was a comfort, the water reminding her of who she was and the life she lived. There was nothing in sight until Dolphin spotted a blue dragon sitting by herself. She hummed a quiet tune, looking down at the rippling yet calm water beneath her. Hello, Dolphin said. Where, where is this? The other dragon stopped her song to look at the visitor, her muscles sagging with relief. I've been waiting a good while to see you up here, the mystery dragon replied. I've been waiting since the day the river hole was discovered to watch your baby grow. My baby? Aurora Borealis? Yes, the dragon said in a whisper. I'm listening to her now. The realization of where she was hit Dolphin suddenly like a rogue wave, but a calmness replaced it all the same. 
What? What's she doing? The other dragon smiled, looking back down at the almost still water. She's singing. With her sister. I've been humming the tune, if you could hear it. She's a very pretty young voice. I cannot wait to witness what she becomes. Dolphin looked down with her. Does she know about the prophecy? The dragon shook her head slowly. Not yet, but she will. Dolphin's heart picked up for a few beats, but the look of the dragon and her sanity washed over her. It'll be okay. She won't be alone. She'll be the best version of herself she could ever be in any ocean on any land. She loves you, and your wisdom will never be lost with her. Your dragonette has a good heart, Dolphin. There will be no worry. She believed every word that dragon said to her. Thank you, Dolphin replied, in a voice no louder than a whisper of the wind. The smile and understanding she got in return was a comfort so dear to her. My aurora borealis shine in the sky someday. She'll reach the places I never could. I am so, so proud of her. With that thought, Dolphin let the rippling waters welcome her into an ocean of a new life. Wow, it's over. Honestly, I'm so connected to this narrative and its characters, and I'm really glad I was able to turn it into something so great. If you've been watching until the end, huge thank you. Add that to your comment, and I'll be sure to give you extra gratitude. Thank you all so much for your patience, and I hope this story was worth the wait. What was your favorite part? Let me know down below. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video, which will be another special one. Bye!